welcome to Eagle's Nest. Happy Father's Day! To dads, grandpops, and pop-ups around the world. So, and to ours. And to our nanas too. And to our dad, and to, and to our pop-up and grandpa. We, you always said we're popping and pop-ups. No, I said, I said dads, grandpops, and pop-ups around the world. But that still means ours. Yeah, but we want to especially, especially mean ours. Anyway, then no one wants to say it. I'm not going to say that. Well, then say I'm saying that. that. Welcome to Eagle's Nest. Happy Father's Day! You just got in. To dads, grandpops, and pop-ups around the world. And to our dad, uh, and to our dad, grandpop, and pop-up. We love you, pop-up and grandpop. Uh, and move on to sissy. Now for today's announcements. If you are new here, after church, go to Starting Point over there at the back of the church. In the back of the store. I mean, or send us an in email. The back of the or send us an email at hello eaglesnest.ch. If you go online, you can you can you can go find us at our website, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Subscribe to our channel and listen to Miss Taylor on our podcast. <laughs> what does my voice sound funny? <laughs> Take me out to the ball game is back. Hey Mac, we're gonna go to the baseball game, and you can too. On Wednesday, July nineteenth, we can all go together for a special ticket price. Sign up at on. If here on Sunday morning you go to the lobby, you go, you know, you just go to the lobby. And but if you're online, you go to Hello Eagles Nest. You go to Hello Eagles Nest. Ca. Eagles Nest Kids is fun with other kids just like me and me. <laughs> We sing, do Bible stories, learn more about Jesus. Wow, you are in the big service. Come join us. This is bad. This is bad. You got this, buddy. You got this. You got this. Okay. If you're a bust, it's great. <clears throat> Teenagers. And then you can check out E N E Eagles Nest Youth after worship in the big service. Mr. Andrew is great. If you'd like to give Eagles Nest, if you like to, if you like to give to Eagles Nest, you can give after after church in the baskets, or you can mail mail your gift, or you can give give at line at eaglesnest.ch. This week, Pastor Jay is telling us more about the power of Jesus by talking about Jairus and his daughter. Um, Jesus is more important than anything else. But right now we are going to worship with Mr. Paul and the worship team. Let's sing. I'm Paul and this is Helen. Thank you for letting us be your worship leaders this morning. Let's worship him. We're clearing off the surface. You're coming into focus We're going back to the basics The glory of your faces The reason why we do this Winds of worship blowing The doors of heaven open Jesus, you're at the center Lord, help us to remember reason why we do this and it's all about you yes it's all about you always has been always will be all about you all about you Priorities 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to our online service. I'm Pastor Jay, the Associate Pastor here at Eagle's Nest, and I'm so glad to be sharing today's message with you. I'd like to wish all the dads out there a very happy Father's Day. Well, Pastor Bob and I have been in a series called Wonders, examining 10 miracles from Matthew's Gospel. We've grouped these miracles by category instead of preaching them in the same sequence Matthew records them. Last month, we uncovered Wonders by the Touch of Jesus, for the month of June, 
we'll be talking about wonders by the power of Jesus. If you'd like to catch up with us, you can find all of our past sermons and much more right on our website, eaglesnest.ch, or on our YouTube channel. Our theme passage for this series comes from Matthew 28, 18, where it says, Jesus came up and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's a pretty bold but clear statement made by Jesus himself. And so today we're going to uncover what the next miracle is saying to us by the power of Jesus in a Father's Day message called Abba. Before we get into the message, in honor of Father's Day, I have a top 10 list for you. These are my top 10 dad jokes. You got to really try hard on some of these, okay? If you don't get them, I'm actually going to be embarrassed for you. All right, ready? Here we go. Number 10. My dream job is to clean mirrors because I can really see myself doing that. Number nine, I used to really hate facial hair, but then it started to grow on me. Yeah. Number eight, my boss asked me recently why I only seem to get sick on work days. I said it must be my weekend immune system. I mean, come on guys, that's just verbal gold. <laughs> We're renovating the house, number seven. We're renovating the house, and so far, the first floor is going great. But the second floor, that's a whole nother story. Yes. Number six, every night I seem to have a hard time remembering things, but eventually it dawns on me. Yep, every morning. Come on, people. These are the jokes. We're halfway there. This is number five. At first, I thought my chiropractor wasn't any good but now I stand corrected. <laughs> Come on, that's funny. I don't care who you are. Number four, I can tolerate algebra, maybe even a little calculus, but geometry is where I draw the line. Yeah, math teacher nerd joke. Number three, my therapist just told me that I seem to have problems expressing my emotions. I can't say that I'm surprised. That's pretty good, but my personal favorite is actually number two. I kept wondering why the baseball was getting bigger and bigger, and then it hit me. <laughs> and the number one dad joke has to be the number one on this top 10 list. As you can tell, I love telling dad jokes, and sometimes he laughs. <laughs> All right, if you didn't get any of those, I'm sorry for you. You can ask the person next to you to help you out. Well, thanks for playing my reindeer games with me on this Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you out there. Please remember to celebrate all the great men in your lives, past, present, and future, who've invested in you. All right, well, let's get into today's message. Today's wonder happens in the life of a father, a first century dad. We can read it together in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. It says, while he was saying this, talking about fasting, a synagogue leader came and knelt before Jesus and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Verse 19, Jesus got up and went with the man and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch the cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her and said, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you and the woman was healed at that moment. So in the context of our story, which we're about to get to, Jesus gets interrupted by this woman. We talked about her story on Mother's Day, and this happens while Jesus is on his way to help this little girl. Verse 23, when Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing pipes, he said, go away. This girl's not dead, she's asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he, Jesus, went in and he took the girl by the hand and she got up. And news of this spread throughout all that region. Before we discover exactly what this miracle is saying to us, I want to show you something first. I mentioned earlier today's message is titled Abba. And the word Abba may have different meanings to different people. Or maybe you've never even heard of that word. So I think it would be helpful for us to fully understand the meaning behind this ancient word together. If you ever heard of ABBA, you might be thinking of the 1970s Swedish pop group that's saying Waterloo and Dancing Queen, but I'm not talking about that ABBA. But that's not the ABBA we're talking about today. 
More likely, perhaps you've been in a church or you've heard someone use the word Abba translated to daddy or papa. This sort of informal and, and familiar nickname that a little child would use for his father. It kind of makes us imagine a little kid jumping into his father's lap or wanting to be held by his dad. And that transliteration of the word Abba isn't wrong, but it may not convey the full meaning of Abba in the context of Jesus' day. Stay with me, I'll show you what we're talking about. We know the word Abba is used only three times in the Bible, and each time the word Father follows it. The Apostle Paul uses Abba Father in Romans 8.15 and Galatians 4.6, and then Jesus himself says Abba Father only one time in Scripture in Mark 14.36, which we'll read together a bit later. Author C.J. Lovick ex examines the full meaning of the word Abba from modern day use in Judaism and back in ancient times. And the best way that I know how to describe what I read is to imagine the various meanings of the phrase Abba Father on a sliding scale. In other words, on the far left of the scale, the word Abba would mean Daddy or Papa. This is the image I described earlier. It's the very loving and intimate relationship between a child and his dad and the young child asking to be held by his father. To the far right of the sliding scale, Abba translates more closely to the word father. This still implies a very close and intimate relationship between the child and dad, but it adds another nuance. It gives it a fuller meaning. C.J. Lovick writes in his book, he describes a moment when he witnessed the use of the word Abba in modern day Israel. It's pretty cool. Lovick was flying to the Tel Aviv airport in 2007, and while in the airport restroom of all places, he overhears this conversation between a Jewish son and his dad. Fortunately for Lovick and for us, the conversation was both in English and in Hebrew. Essentially, the father was telling his son to wash his hands after using the restroom, but it was clear from his tone that the child wasn't fully complying. And as this father was helping his son wash his hands, he tells his son somewhat sternly, but in English, when I ask you to do something, I want you to respond, Abba. And it's from that conversation that we can get a glimpse into the second meaning of Abba. In fact, this story reminds me of my own grandkids as they try to learn to obey their parents. Whenever my son-in-law has to gently correct his kids, let's say in a public setting, just like the Jewish father did in this restroom, you might hear my son-in-law say Colton or Abby. When I tell you no, I don't want you to argue with me. You need to say, yes, daddy. And it's the same kind of response Lovick is talking about when he translates the word Abba, father. When we hear a child responding, yes, daddy, yes, father, it signals a healthy respect, a willingness to do what they're told. There's still an intimate closeness that's implied, but the child is acknowledging the father as an authority figure in their life. And Lovick says that it's this added meaning to Abba Father that Jesus would have used in his prayer that night. The first thing we notice when Jesus prays Abba Father is their intimacy. Whether you translate the word to daddy, to papa, or to father, all three of them indicate a level of intimacy and closeness between a father and son. And here in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus finds himself in his most desperate hour prior to Passion Week. This is one of Jesus' most vulnerable moments in his earthly life. It's in this critical moment that he, Jesus, instinctively, very intimately, withdraws from his friends. He needs to be alone with the most important relationship he had. We can listen in on Jesus' prayer as the soldiers march closer towards the garden in Mark 14, verse 36, Jesus cries out, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Jesus is pleading with his dad. He knows he's about to die. He says, Father, you can do all things. So if there's another way, don't make me drink from this bitter cup. It's a very vulnerable moment between a son and his dad. But I want us to take note 
of the second meaning of Abba in his prayer. It's not just intimacy, it's also obedience. Even though Jesus is pleading for an alternative from his father, we know how great his stress level was because scripture says he was sweating drops of blood. Jesus still finishes his prayer with yet. Hold on a minute. Don't even go too far past these three letters strung together in Jesus's prayer. They hold a ton of value. Christian, I would encourage you to add the word yet to your prayer life. You see, with this one word, Jesus is declaring, Father, I know you love me greatly. I'm your only begotten son. But I also know your great love for mankind and your desire to invite everyone into our family. So in spite of what I have to go through, in spite of the pain, and in spite of your response to my prayer, even if you find no other way, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Church, we have to get to this place like Jesus did when God gets to make the call where we let go of whatever we're hoping for, whatever we're praying for, things from our perspective, and we give it over fully to him. If we can learn to yield to the Father and submit to his will in our lives, it would change everything. And like Jesus, that's what we are called to do. Jesus knows his Father's will is the only way. He knows there are no other options. And even though he's facing a slow, very agonizing death on a Roman cross, Jesus the Son yields to his Father. At the end of the prayer, when all avenues are exhausted, Jesus simply says, yes, Daddy. You see, obedience adds a little bit more meaning to the term Abba Father, doesn't it? So let's get back to our miracle in Matthew. There are four things I want to highlight from our story about this particular father. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 tells us, While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter's just died, but put your hand on her and she will live. First, I want us to notice this man's response to Jesus is atypical. I find it odd that this father, a leader in the Jewish synagogue, pursues Jesus. That's not the usual response we find from the Jewish religious folks, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. By and large, these Jewish religious leaders opposed Jesus. His teaching offended them and threatened their authority. Jesus disregarded their man-made rules and taught scripture with an authority like no other. He performed signs and wonders and attracted multitudes of Jewish people everywhere he went. We learn from the Gospel of Mark that this man's name is Jairus. And Jairus is one of the rulers of the synagogue in Capernaum. But why was Jairus different than his peers? Why was Jesus his first response when his daughter was dying? We know from the Gospel accounts that Jesus performed many miracles in and around Capernaum. This is where Jesus spent a great deal of time during his three-year ministry. Capernaum was located within the greater region known as Galilee. You might not have realized this, but as you can see from the map on the screen, Galilee was a large region. So when we hear the word Galilee or someone being from Galilee, it includes several smaller towns that we can read about. For example, the region of Galilee included towns like Cana. This is where Jesus performed his first recorded miracle by turning water into wine. Galilee also includes this town we're in today in Capernaum, where Jairus worked and lived. And it also includes Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. But none of that <laughs> explains why Jairus is different from his peers, why he is atypical about Jesus. Let's take a look into Mark's gospel account of another story that I believe greatly influenced Jairus. Mark 1 verse 21 tells us this story. They went to Capernaum, speaking of Jesus and the disciples, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Note this is the same synagogue where Jairus works. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit, a demon, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Can you imagine hearing this in church? <laughs> this demon knew exactly who Jesus was and called him by name. In verse 25, Jesus told, tells the demon, be quiet. He said sternly, come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. This man Jairus would have witnessed this event firsthand and this experience must have changed how he felt about Jesus. Not only was Jairus' response to Jesus atypical, Jairus had come to truly believe in Jesus. Notice Jairus doesn't hesitate or have any doubt when he approaches Jesus and says, come and put your hand on her and she will live. You see, Jairus believed Jesus could heal his daughter. He had seen and heard enough throughout Capernaum to know that all Jesus had to do was to touch her and she would live. Jairus saw how Jesus interacted with that impure spirit and more importantly, how that spirit responded to Jesus. This wasn't a physical realm type miracle. This was a whole nother dimension, exerting control and authority over demons. This was a supernatural power. And then imagine hearing the demons call Jesus by name and proclaiming him to be the Holy One of God. Jairus believed and he knew Jesus was from God. And it's because of this that he was prepared to put himself, his job, his family, and his own daughter's life, his own reputation on Jesus. Third, I want you to take note of the barriers in Jairus' way. When his daughter gets gravely ill, Jairus has to go looking for Jesus. There's no 911 phone call. There's no bat signal to flash into the sky. This father is about to lose his little girl. And he had to search the entire city of Capernaum to find Jesus. Imagine how much time, precious time, this would have taken with his daughter's life at stake. Can you imagine trying to run around town trying to locate someone while your little girl is dying? And then when eventually Jairus finds Jesus, he still has to get him to come from wherever he's at back to his home. And if all that searching didn't take long enough, Jesus gets delayed even more while traveling with Jairus home. The second barrier must have been even more frustrating. Jairus was probably like, wait a minute, Jesus, why are we stopping? All significant barriers Jairus faced before his miracle happened. Fourth, I want you to remember with every miracle, everyone recorded, there's a message for us because every miracle speaks. And this miracle demonstrates the authority and the power of Jesus. Verse 25 tells us, after the crowd had been put outside, he, Jesus, went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. In Mark's account, he gives us more detail. Matthew's a man of few words. Mark 5, 41 says, he took her by the hand and he said to her in Aramaic, Tali takum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately this girl stood up and began to walk around. She was dead. She was only 12 years old, Mark says. And at this, they were all completely astonished. Jesus gave strict orders not to tell anyone about it and told them to give her something to eat. You see, Matthew is proclaiming with this miracle by the power of Jesus that this isn't a regular guy. Jesus doesn't just perform miracles in the physical realm. He operates on a whole nother plane. There's an authority Jesus had that is not from this world. It's supernatural. Jesus speaks to demons and they know his name. He commands them to go here and to go there and they must obey. He resurrects the dead, a lifeless body of this little girl. The funeral service had already started. He heals the blind, the deaf, the mute, the sick, the leper. Even on the way, he cures an uncurable disease like the woman with the issue of blood. And then at the end of his book, Matthew tells us after Jesus is killed, he's crucified and buried in a tomb, that even the grave 
cannot hold Jesus. Jesus resurrected from death and he reappeared to hundreds of people. And then right before he ascended through the clouds back to heaven, he says this in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, all authority. In the Amplified Bible, it says, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then Jesus gives us the great commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. When we take those four points out of the story and apply them to our lives, it looks like this. This is what you can take home from today's story. First, learn to be like Jairus. Be atypical. Did you know Christians aren't called to be normal? We're not supposed to fit in here in this world. We're also called to be atypical. First Peter two verse nine tells us, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for God's own possession. In the King James, it says you are a peculiar people. Friends, that's atypical. Why? Just so that we can be weird? No. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Christians, we must stop being so casual about the miraculous salvation gift we've been freely given by God. Verse 10 tells us, for you once were not a people, but now you're the people of God. You've not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Church, just like Jairus, we too are called to be peculiar and set apart. We're to be atypical. Number two, believe. I'm not going to sugarcoat this one for you. Like Jairus, you too must fully believe in Jesus Christ. He's the only path to God's free gift of salvation. The reason Jesus had such an intimate relationship with God the Father was because he was the only begotten son. You don't have to be good enough. You can't earn your way. And it doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus offers you and me forgiveness and restoration today. He only requires that you have faith to believe in him. John 6, 47, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. This invitation is for you and for anyone that would believe in Jesus. Number three, barriers. Just like in Jairus's story, quite often there are barriers on our journey. And I'll be the first to admit it always seems like God arrives late to the party, doesn't it? But I've come to realize over time that barriers, speed bumps, are part of our training. They teach us how to follow Christ properly. When we face barriers, it forces us to trust God for the answer and to have faith that he's working all things for our good. But we don't like barriers, do we? We don't like waiting. We don't like lessons in patience. We want God to operate on our timetable, but that almost never happens. And like Jairus, some things we're waiting on are quite serious. They're important. They're stressful, they're hard, and they're difficult things. When barriers pop up in your life, what is your first response? Is it fear? Is it anger? Is it disappointment and frustration? That's all normal. But God calls us to be abnormal, atypical. When we experience delays and barriers or when God says no or wait to our prayer request, we have to learn in every circumstance to trust in him. Through trials and tribulations, when barriers appear, Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access. How have we gained access? By faith into this grace in which we now stand. I'm going to give you the bad news first. Suffering, difficulty, and pain are often part of this human life, even for Christians. 
But here's the good news. All the pain, the difficulty, the barriers that pop up in our lives, if you will persevere through them with God's help, they can be the very things that will help produce the man or the woman he intends you to be. And fourth, when it comes to authority, don't put your faith and trust in any man. Jairus, he's just a dad like most. He just happens to see Jesus for who he really was and is the son of God. But only Jesus has the authority to bring dead things back to life. I don't know you or where your life journey has ended up, but I can promise you Jesus can restore you. He can put back the broken pieces. He has the authority and the power to permanently change a life. You only need to call on his name. On this Father's Day, would you commit your life to be more like Jairus? This dad who in his most desperate moment sought out the only one that could save his little girl. Like Jairus, I want you to commit your life to these four things. Get comfortable being atypical for God. Have a strong faith to believe in Jesus, no matter what. Persevere through the barriers that pop up in this life that slow down progress and know that they only help to develop the character in you. And finally, Jesus changes everything. He has all authority over heaven and earth. Would you invite him in and watch him transform your life? A bit earlier, I brought up the 70s band ABBA. For you true ABBA fans out there, did you know this? The band was named ABBA using the first initial from each of the four band members' first names. And so likewise, I want you to go back and look at our four sermon points. The first letter of each spells A, B, B, A, Abba. Dads, on this Father's Day, I pray that you're inspired to be a bit more like the father in today's story. You can do that with God's help. Wherever you're watching from, I hope you have a blessed Father's Day. Be sure to thank any father figures or role models in your life and wish them all a happy Father's Day. Can we pray together? Father, we thank you for the encouragement today from Scripture that you are with us even when we walk through the shadow of the valley of death. In a life like Jairus where all hope is lost from an earthly perspective and his 12 year 12-year-old little, little girl has died. Hope is gone, except for Jesus. Jesus, you walked into the room, you touched her, and you raised her up. And you do so for everyone under the sound of my voice. You take our broken and dead, empty lives, and you fill it with so much more. I pray, Father, that everyone on this Father's Day hears this, and Father, that they would come to know you, Jesus, as their personal Lord and Savior. It's in your heavenly name that I pray. Amen. Please enjoy this next worship song. Have a great Father's Day. Take care.
Lift your voice. 